the formation of Turco-Islamic peoples and cultures. Viewed from a Middle Eastern vantage point, the Turkish influx into the Islamic world occurred in three stages. The first phase began in the 9th century, when unconverted Turkic nomads, captured in border raids, were used as slave soldiers in Baghdad or elsewhere in the Middle East. Converted to Islam and assimilated culturally, they created no lasting Turkic presence in the Middle East. The second phase began in the 10th century, when a minor ruling clan from Transoxania, the Seljuks, converted to Islam and migrated into Iran to seek its fortune. So began the remarkable career of the Turks as empire builders in the Islamic Middle East. The Seljuks' tribal followers created a significant Turkic ethnic presence in the Middle East and no doubt also an oral Turkish Islamic folk culture. Yet the Seljuk elite never created a Turkish Islamic literary culture. That began to occur in the 11th century in Transoxania where the Turkic Karakhanid dynasty and its subjects converted in mass. The Karakhanids' conversion marked a critical phase in the Islamization of Inner Asia. However, because they were sited north of the Amur Darya, Oxus River, this did not mark a new phase in the creation of a Turkish Muslim presence inside the Middle East. The third phase in forming a Turkish presence inside the Middle East, that of creating a Turkish literary culture to go with the Turkish demographic presence, would have to wait nearly until the Ottomans rise in the 14th century. During the first phase of the Turks' entry into the Middle East, prisoners captured in the borderlands between Khorasan and Transoxania were brought into central Islamic lands, converted to Islam, and used as slave soldiers. The Turks' history thus intersected with that of the Abbasid Caliphs, and earlier patterns of recruiting military forces that were either alien or servile, were fused. Muslims valued the steppe Turks' prowess in horsemanship and archery, memorably described by the Arabic essayist al jais and their fine appearance. The Abbasid Caliphs began to use Turkic slave soldiers early in the 9th century. In particular, Al-Mutazm created a retinue including regiments of Turkish slaves, Ghulam or Mamluk. Not subject to all the disabilities of chattel slavery, the Ghulams were carefully trained to serve as agents of their powerful master, for whom their chief value lay in the unconditional loyalty they owed him. As stated in a verse quoted by Nizam al-Mulk, vizier to the Seljuk sultans and author of perhaps the best-known Islamic manual for princes. One obedient slave is better than three hundred sons. For the latter desire their father's death, the former his master's glory. Such thinking did not always pay off, but persistence in it turned slave recruitment into a key feature of Middle Eastern state formation for a thousand years. Unfortunately for the Abbasids, their slave soldiers took only a few decades to traverse the distance from palace guard to regimental commander, unruly provincial governor, founder of a petty local dynasty, and even king-maker in Baghdad. Forces intended to strengthen the Islamic Caliphate had strengthened the centrifugal tendencies within it. Examples include the Tulunid dynasty in Egypt and Syria, 868-905, and the Akshidids who followed them in Egypt. There were also contestants for power who were of neither Turkic nor slave origin. The dynasty of governors most known for recruiting Turkic Ghulams in this period was that of the Samanids, Iranian governors of the Transoxanian frontier zone, who were also patrons of the nascent Perso-Islamic literary culture. So active were they in slave raiding and slave trading that by the late 10th century the market for slaves had become glutted and depressed. The Samanids acquired their own Turkic slave soldiers and developed a slave training system that Nizam al-Mulk declared exemplary. Perhaps the system worked too well, the Samanids were eclipsed by a dynasty that emerged from their slave troops, the Ghaznavids, who founded an empire stretching from Khorasan to Central Asia and India. Many Turks thus first encountered Islam as the targets of slave raids conducted amid rhetorical flourishes about Gaza. Turkic tribesmen in the frontier zone lived by raiding the Muslims as much as Muslim border defenders lived by raiding them, in Arabic sources, the same verb, Gaza, applies in either case. 
Yet Islam gave a religious justification to this way of life in addition to earthly booty, a promise of heavenly reward, a promise that probably helped win converts to Islam. The raiders' impact could be traumatic, especially on peoples whose religions, in this case the indigenous inner Asian cults, made them ineligible for dhimmi status. In 893, for example, the Samanids took the town of Talas in what is now southern Kazakhstan, killing and capturing thousands, including the ruler's wife, some notables saved themselves by converting to Islam. However much power they achieved, the local dynasties that were formed inside the Abbasid Caliphate by Turkic slave soldiers, Ghulams, created no lasting Turkic presence there. Even slave states that lasted into the post-Abbasid period were not greatly different in this regard, neither the slave kings, from whom India's Delhi Sultanate emerged, nor Egypt's Mamluk Sultanate left Turkic societies behind. To create an appreciable Turkish presence in the Middle East became the work of the Seljuks. The Seljuks' origins lie clouded in the ethnogenesis of the Oghuz Turks, whose history of state formation began in the 9th century, prior to their conversion to Islam. The original Seljuk, a commander from the Kinnik tribe of the Oghuz, converted to Islam in 985 at Jand on the Sir Darya, Jaxarts River. The biblical names of his four sons, Mikael, Israel, Musa, and Yunus, Jonah, suggest previous acquaintance with either Khazar Judaism or Nestorian Christianity. Now, they and their followers became part of the Islamized, Turkic border population that warred with the pagans in the steppe. Pressured by tribal movements and political instability, they were universally described as a bedraggled, sorry lot, driven by desperation and impending starvation to conquest. Serving first one petty dynast and then another, under Mikhail's sons Togril and Chagri, they migrated into Khorasan and began raiding the local populace. Ghazis raiding infidels were one thing, Muslims preying on Muslims were quite another. Ghaznavid attempts to stop this led to battle at Dandankan, May 23, 1040, a victory of Seljuk desperation over Ghaznavid exhaustion. The Seljuks became masters of Khorasan, expanding their power into Transoxania and across Iran. By 1055 Togrul had expanded his control all the way to Baghdad, setting himself up as the champion of the Abbasid Caliph, who honored him with the title Sultan. Earlier rulers may have used this title, but the Seljuks seem to have been the first to inscribe it on their coins. The formation of the Great Seljuk Empire, which held together under Togrul, Alp Arslan, and Malik Shah, proved highly significant in both Islamic and Turkic terms. During the preceding century, signs of the Abbasid loss of control had included not only political decentralization but also, by some accounts, a proliferation of Shia I movements and dynasties. Islamic historian Marshall Hodgson spoke of a Shia I century, from 946, when the Iranian Shia I Bayats occupied Baghdad, to 1055, when the Seljuks took the city and rescued the Abbasid Caliph from the Bayats. The idea that the Seljuks reversed a rising tide of Shia I influence now seems inflated. The rise of Shia I regimes in some places did not necessarily mean the widespread of Shia I allegiance among the populace. The Seljuks seem to have been sufficiently caught up in the religious controversies of Iran's nascent Sunni synthesis that their own religious position was not yet as clear cut as the Sunni Hanafi allegiance that has been retrospectively credited to them. Yet they clearly immersed themselves in their new religious identity. It has been said that Muslim Turks sank their national identity in Islam as the Arabs and Persians had never done. The Seljuks launched a new period of Sunni Islamic reunification, integration under the Abbasid Caliphate, and expansion against the Byzantines and the European Crusaders. A century after Togril entered Baghdad, Shia I power centers like the Egyptian based Fatimid Caliphate had been eliminated, and prayers were, again, recited in the name of the Sunni Caliph of Baghdad over all the lands of Islam from Central Asia into Africa. Not only reintegration and expansion but also a new stratification of power emerged, in which legitimacy and prestige belonged to the Abbasid Caliph, 
but political power belonged to sultans or other synonymously titled rulers who acquired power by conquest and claimed legitimacy from him. As a late Seljuk sultan, Sanjar, wrote to the caliph's vizier in 1133, We have received from the lord of the world, the kingship of the world. We have a standard and a covenant. This division of power continued on down the ladder in the Emirayen system, with the caliph theoretically at the top, then the various sultans or other autonomous rulers supposedly acting as his agents, then the commanders, Amir, of their military forces, then the notables, Ayen, from the indigenous populace who mediated between conquerors and conquered, and lastly the subject populace. Resembling this Amir Ayen system, a somewhat similar Ayen system would later emerge in the Ottoman Empire. The Seljuk Sultanate was significant for Turkic, as well as Islamic, political culture. A new charismatic ruling clan, the Seljuks were the first such to emerge from the Oghuz Turks. The title Sultan began to replace that of Kagan as the most prestigious title for a Muslim Turkic ruler, and Turkic ideas about rulership and its legitimization began to be interwoven with Islamic motifs. For example, the Seljuks adopted elements of Abbasid, Bayid, and Ghaznavid statecraft, including the creation of their own Ghulam Corps, or the assignment of Iktas, land grants or revenue grants, depending on the situation, as a way to compensate important functionaries. In the long run, most Turkish dynasties did become identified with Sunni Islam and with the Hanafi school of jurisprudence, the one least restrictive of the ruler's discretion and the most accommodating to custom. The Seljuks benefited in far-reaching ways from Iranian religious and literary dynamism and from the crisis conditions that forced many Iranian scholars to emigrate in this period, spreading both Persian literary culture and the various constituents of the evolving Sunni synthesis, including the religious colleges, Medrasi, that provided the Islamic world with its institutions of higher learning. Part of the excitement of Islamic high culture as the Seljuks encountered it was that it included heterogeneous elements, some of them pre-Islamic in origin. For example, the ideological resources that Islamic political thought offered the Seljuks included both genuinely Islamic themes, like Sharia observance, and political philosophical motifs with non-Islamic roots. Such was the old Iranian idea of the authoritarian monarch who dispenses justice by his own unfettered judgment, or the circle of justice, an idealized description of the reciprocal relationship between rulers and ruled. Islamic civilization, in short, was already a synthesis of elements from different sources. This fact provided a basis for reciprocal interaction between Islamic and Turkic ideas, as became particularly apparent in the realm of political culture. Clearly, the Seljuk Empire was a new kind of state in Turkic experience. A dynasty of nomadic origin had acquired power over an ethnically alien, agrarian society of ancient culture. The dynasty would have to employ experts from that society to administer it and would have to assimilate culturally to a significant extent. Emblematic of this shift, whereas the first Seljuk sultans bore Turkic zoonyms, or animal names, still redolent of traditional steppe culture, Togrul, Jurfalkan, Alp Arslan, Hero Lion. The third bore a name that broadcast Seljuk political pretensions to all Muslims, Malik Shah, a name made out of two common nouns meaning king in Arabic and Persian, respectively. Togrul had apparently divided rulership, east and west, with his brother Chagri, a familiar Turkic theme. The Syriac chronicler Bar Hebreus noted another point evocative of steppe culture in speaking of Khatun, as he calls Togrul's wife, all the business of the kingdom was administered by her. Of course, Khatun, lady, was not her name, but a title. Under Alp Arslan and Malik Shah, dual kingship vanished, and the administration was headed instead by the distinguished Iranian vizier, Nizam al-Mulk. The dynasty's sedentarization and adoption of Irano-Islamic high culture could only alienate its original followers. To rise to power and turn against one's old supporters is a political game at once old and ever new, this would not be the last such occurrence. 
not only founding madrisis and hiring Iranian bureaucrats but also recruiting Ghulams as a way to create a more reliable military force than their tribal supporters, the Seljuks began as early as 1048 to direct the tribes toward the Iranian Byzantine and Caucasian frontiers. Born on the eastern frontier against heathendom, their religious fervor was now carried to the western frontier against Christendom. By now centuries old, the Islamic Byzantine frontier zone, running from Tarsus to Erzurum, had long since ceased to be a site of active territorial expansion and become a place where many Ghazis were really knights of the prayer niche, for San al -Mirup. Yet cross-border raiding continued, and the border zone exerted a powerful attraction over Muslims who wished to escape the authority of rulers, ascetics, Ghazis, even scholars, including the authors of major works on jihad. The Byzantines again pushed forward into this frontier zone between 950 and 1000. On the Muslim side, however, the influx of Turks generated a new expansive dynamism, which led to the Battle of Manzikert, or Malazgird. A truly decisive battle, Manzikert broke the Byzantine border defenses, opened Anatolia to Turkic immigration, and so launched a new phase in the expansion of the frontiers of Islam. The Seljuks' tribal followers had done what earlier Muslims had failed for centuries to do. For the next several centuries, Anatolia would be a kind of Wild West, where the historic Turkic competition between micropolity and macropolity would continue, becoming reconfigured over time under the impact of Islamic culture and a new environment. Political science, Seljuk style, thus introduced new elements into Turkic political culture yet the Seljuks also failed to solve some of its old problems. Preserving the idea of the ruling clan's collective sovereignty, the Seljuks experienced both succession conflicts and territorial splits resulting from the assumption that each member of the ruling clan was entitled to rule a part of the dynastic patrimony. Another source of division was the appointment of Atabegs, Father Bays, the young prince's tutors, who governed in the prince's name and could marry his mother and take over as governor if the prince died. A number of Atabeg dynasties emerged as a result. Gradually, the Seljuks lost control of the Ikta system, and the Iktas, too, became hereditary. Malik Shah's death in 1092, a few months after Ismaili Shia I assassins killed Nizam al-Mulk, ended Seljuk unity. In time the push toward political reintegration would resume, but lasting results would require solutions to some of these problems in statecraft. Those lessons were learned painfully and anonymously, perhaps as scribes and soldiers who had served fallen rulers rode off toward the horizon in search of a new master whose good fortune, Dala in Arabic, was still on the rise. Historians call the empire of Togrul, Alp Arslan, and Malik Shah the Great Seljuk Empire, as opposed to the smaller Seljuk and Atabeg states into which it decomposed after 1092. One of those was the Seljuk state of Rum, formed in Anatolia, to Arabs, Bilad al-Rum, the land of the Romans in the sense of Byzantines. Between 1071 and the Mongol conquest of the Rum Seljuks, perhaps a million Turks entered Anatolia, forming not its largest ethnic group but the only one spread throughout that region. They were made up partly of tribal groupings, but not entire tribes, as well as other social groups, including bands of Ghazis and Dervishes. Fragments of tribes, wandering Dervishes, Ghazi bands, this was a society in flux. A rebellious branch of the Seljuk dynasty, the sons of Kutlamish, moved into Anatolia and rallied some of the tribesmen. One of Kutlamish's sons, Suleiman, acquired control of Konya, made it the capital, and proclaimed himself sultan. Byzantine attempts to regain control ended at the Battle of Myriokephalon in 1176, and the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum reached its height in the early 13th century. The Seljuks of Rum faced feuds within the dynasty and rival Turkish statelets in Anatolia, even before the Mongols invaded and reduced them all to tributary status. In particular, the Danish Men dynasty held parts of north-central Anatolia throughout the period. Meanwhile, amid the migratory swarm that Turkified Anatolia, 
the dispersion of learned men from the Persian-speaking East paradoxically made of the Seljuk court at Konya a new center for Perso-Islamic court culture, as exemplified by the great mystical poet Jalaleddin Rumi. A major reflection of the Anatolian Turkish culture of the time takes the form of a prose epic on the exploits of Siyid Bat Talghazi, whom Turkic legend held to be the ancestor of the Danish Mems. Originally an Arab commander who fought in 9th century campaigns against the Byzantines, Bat Tal Ghazi became the stuff of legend first in Arabic and then, starting in the late 11th or early 12th century, in Turkish. Resembling the Byzantine hero of the borderlands, Digenis Akritas, who is mentioned in the Bat Tal Nami, Bat Tal Book, Bat Tal Ghazi in his mythic appropriation as the progenitor of a Turkish dynasty, show how the Turks tied themselves into the syncretic warp and weft of life in the frontier world of Anatolia. Something of a sequel to the Bat Tal Nami, the Danish Men Nami recounts the exploits of the Danish Men Ghazis. The exploits of its heroes and heroines interweave personal conversion, intermarriage, hybridity, and Ghazi daring do in the borderlands of Islam. Unconcerned about thematic consistency, the Book of Didi Korkut, which acquired its present form after 1200, likewise works contemporary references and Islamic strands like the Gaza into a set of folktales recalling the Oghuz Turks' pre-Islamic heroics. In contrast to the starker terms on which the still unconverted Turks of Central Asia had first confronted Muslim frontier warriors, the Turks in Anatolia encountered a mostly Christian population, whose status as peoples of the book, al al kitab made them eligible to live under Islamic rule as Dimas. In Anatolia, for centuries after the Battle of Manzikert, cultures and creeds coexisted as much as competed. Probably few places were not frontier zones at some point, and the defenders on both the Byzantine and Islamic sides of these frontiers came to know each other well. The long-term trend, however, was toward Islamization and Turkification. Heroes as different as the Byzantines Digenis Akritas, the twice-born border warrior, so-called because he was the son of a Byzantine mother and a Christianized Arab commander, or two of Didi Korkut's heroes, Bamsi Bayrek and Kinturali, both of whom chose infidel brides, show that intermarriage was one of the most prominent themes in this environment. Documenting the cultural symbiosis differently, 12th-century coins of the Danish men's display their names and titles, such as Amir and Ghazi, in both Arabic and Greek letters. If the Turks came to Anatolia as conquerors in 1071, the future Turkish people would be descendants of the conquered as much as of the conquerors. Between the 1240s and the 1340s, however, major crises disrupted both the macro-politics of Turkic state formation and the micro-politics of tribalism in this frontier environment. From 1243 on, Repeated Mongol invasions and tribute exactions severely weakened the Seljuks of Rum, an oft-cited fact. In the 1340s, the Black Plague struck Byzantium and parts of Anatolia, a fact overlooked in historical writing on the Ottomans, possibly because the plague carried off literate eyewitnesses from their midst. Henceforth, state formation would require coming to terms with a social landscape consisting to an unusual degree of ad hoc groupings that were in a state of ferment. A new round of statelets, bailiks, that formed in the Rum Seljuk's frontier zones became the dynamic elements in Anatolian politics. From one of these, the Ottoman Empire would emerge. The statelets competed for influence in an environment where popular social movements proliferated in response to distressed conditions. Fuad Koprulu characterized those of this period under four headings. Ghazis or Alps, an old Turkic term for warrior heroes. Akis, the Turkish name for the town-based young men's associations known in Arabic as Futua. Heterodox mystical Babas and their followers and the, Sisters of Rum, Bajianai Rum. About these women mystics or Ghazis, tantalizingly little is known, although their mention in one source provides more evidence of the relative gender equality inherited from pre-Islamic Turkic societies. The Amazon heroines in the tales of Didi Korkut and in the Ghazi epics of this period, notably the infidel-born, lion-like Ephraimia of the Danish men name reinforce that image. 
Anatolian counterparts of Baba Tukuls, the heterodox mystical Babas formed numerous, anarchistic movements of wandering dervishes, characterized by radical ascetism and socially deviant forms of renunciation, some of which, bizarrely accoutred states of semi-nakedness, consumption of alcohol or drugs, and deviant sex, were deliberately chosen to provoke censure from the pious, including the more respectable, organized Sufi orders, which were also spreading in this period. Despite appearances to the contrary, the radical dervishes were often recruited from the well-educated and socially prominent. Some of them accompanied the Ghazi bands, while others helped to promote the spread of Islam wherever they wandered. Somewhat resembling Europe's itinerant monastic orders of the same period, the contemporaneity of similar impulses in different religious cultures is a recurrent theme, the wandering dervishes were most characteristic of Anatolia and Iran, thus of regions directly affected by Mongol expansion, and less characteristic of the Arab lands. Once a strong Ottoman state had emerged and become committed to strict Sunni Islam, the deviant movements would later be marginalized or shoehorned into formally organized dervish orders that respected state authority. The deviant movements left behind few documents of the sort historians typically study. However, new epics continued to be produced about both Ghazis and dervishes, such as Umar Pasha, the seafaring Ghazi Bay of Aden, or Sari Saltik, a heterodox, charismatic wonderworking hero of Turkification and Islamization west and north of the Black Sea. The production of such epics followed the advance of the Turkish Ghazis and their dervish Babas into southeastern Europe. Emerging from such a diffusely structured society, the Ottoman Empire would complete the third phase in the establishment of a Turkish presence in the Islamic Middle East by generating a Turco-Islamic high literary culture to accompany the demographic base. It suffices here to note what bases existed for this Turco-Islamic literary culture in Anatolia on the eve of the Ottoman period. The heroic folk epics, which were ultimately recorded in writing, form part of this. During a revolt against the Mongols in 1277, when Memd Bey of Karaman briefly placed a pretender on the Rum Seljuk throne at Konya, the rebels, ignorant of Persian, ordered that from that day forward, in the council, in the dervish lodge, in the court, in the assembly, in the square, no language but Turkish should be spoken. Although that experiment ended with the revolt, a precedent had been set. Also active in the late 13th century was Yunus Emre, Anatolia's first memorable Turkish language poet. Both he and Anatolia's great Persian language poet, Jalaleddin Rumi, were men whose personal and literary lives were transformed by charismatic heterodox dervishes. Rumi's Persian poetry has remained central to the rites of the Mevlevi dervish order, which flourished under the Ottoman Empire, and to Persian literature in general. The Turkish poetry of Yunus Emre and other folk poets has endured as the hymns of Turkey's Alevi religious minority and part of the literary patrimony of Turks everywhere. Little survives in writing from the 14th century Ottomans, no doubt the bubonic plague is greatly to blame. Thereafter, they would create the most important of all Turkic literary cultures.